turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is going to be part 2 of eternal security versus the unpardonable sin. Oh, uh, let's see. I guess we're going to start with verse 10. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of of the truth that they might be saved and for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness Those, that is some strong words. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they received not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they, that they all might be damned, who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. When you love unrighteousness and sin more than you love the Lord, he will deceive you. He will give you strong delusion that you will believe the lie. You know, there are churches in San Francisco, openly homosexual, and they will tell you God made them that way. God made them sodomites. And they will tell you, well, we believe in Jesus and we're saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should be alive, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And none of those churches use the King James. Matter of fact, the ones that I checked all use the NIV. The 84 edition, that is. Okay, Romans chapter 11, we'll start in verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which he seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber. Slumber means sleep. God hath given them the spirit of sleep. God hath given them the spirit of slumber. Eyes that they should not see and ears that they should not hear unto this day. In Matthew 13 and verse 10, the disciples asked Jesus a question because Jesus was always telling things in parables, right? So let's read Matthew 13, 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, the he being Jesus, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. Did you catch that? Because unto you, because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore speak I to them in parables, in parables because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand? And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, 
and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Do you understand what he's saying? He blinds peop some people, he blinds their eyes. Verse 16, but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you, that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. That is heavy duty stuff. In Luke 8, 10, and he, Jesus, and he said, Unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Do you know that there are people that God, it appears that he, that, that the gospel is hidden from them? I mean, that's how I that's my that's how I read it. I, I don't know how else you can look at it. Alright, let's keep going. Turn to first Kings twenty two and verse nine uh, twenty. First Kings chapter twenty two and verse twenty. I just did a Bible study on King Ahab and Jezebel. Ahab was a bad egg. All right, 1 Kings 22 and verse 20. <clears throat> and the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. And there came forth a spirit, and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. Now this is the thing. Um, I respect Mike Hoggard greatly. He, I don't think he's right about everything. I don't think I'm right about everything. But he thinks that this is an evil spirit that I'm getting ready to talk about. I don't believe that. I think this is one of the Lord's angels. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he might go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, another said on that matter. And there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I will go forth, and I will be a lying spirit, a lying spirit, in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him and prevail. Also go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. See, Ahab and Jezebel were into Satanism. They worshipped the devils. And they were having the prophets of Baal to tell Ahab, oh, go fight this battle, you're going to prevail. But the Lord is sending a spirit to lie to Ahab so that he's going to fall. And when they say fall, I'm not just talking about tripping and falling on the ground. I'm talking about falling down and not getting up, dying. The Lord put a lying spirit in the mouth of Ahab's satanic prophets. Can you believe that? That's some heavy-duty stuff right there, people. All right, we're going to go to Isaiah chapter 44. Isaiah is a great book. Wish I understood it better. Okay, Isaiah chapter 44, verse 1. Here now, yet, oh, I'm sorry, yet now hear, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. 
Thus saith the Lord that made thee and formed thee from the womb, which will help thee. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, and thou, Jezurim, whom I have chosen. For I will pour out, for I will pour water upon him that is thirsty, and floods upon the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon thy seed, and my blessing upon thine offspring. And they shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the water courses. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord, and surname himself by the name of Israel. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. I am the first, and I am the last, and besides me there is no God. Remember in Revelation where Jesus says, I am the first, I am the last? I am the Alpha, I am the Omega. Now this is interesting. Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts. Well, who's the Redeemer? That's Christ. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. He paid a price that we couldn't pay. Verse 7. And who, as I, shall call and shall declare it, and set it in order for me, since I appointed the ancient people? And the things that are coming and shall come, let them show unto them. Fear ye not, neither be afraid. Have not I told thee from that time, and have declared it? Ye are even my witnesses. Is there a God beside me? Yea, there is no God. I know not any. They that make a graven image are all of them vanity. Vanity means worthless. And their delectable things shall not profit. And they are their own witness. They see not, nor know, that they may be ashamed. Who hath formed a god, a molten a graven image that is profitable for nothing. Behold, all his fellows shall be ashamed, and the workmen, they are of men. Let them all be gathered together, let them stand up, yet they shall fear, and they shall be ashamed together. The smith with the tongs both worketh in the coals, and fashioneth it with hammers, and worketh it with the strength of his arms. Yea, he is hungry, and his strength faileth. He drinketh no water, and is faint. The carpenter stretcheth out his rule. He marketh it out with a line. He fitteth it with planes, and he marketh it out with the compass, and maketh it after the figure of a man, according to the beauty of a man, that it may remain in the house. He heweth, down, he heweth him down cedars, and taketh the cypress and the oak, which he strengtheneth, strengtheneth for himself among the trees of the forest. He planteth an ash, and the rain doth nourish it. Then it shall be for a man to burn. For he will take thereof, and warm himself, yea, he kindleth, kindleth it, and baketh bread, yea, he maketh a god, worshipeth it, he maketh it a graven image, and falleth down thereto. He burneth part thereof in the fire, with part thereof he eateth flesh, he roasteth roast, and is satisfied, yea, he warmeth himself, and say, Aha, I am warm, I have seen the fire. And the residue thereof he maketh a god, even his graven image. He falleth down unto it, and worshipeth it, and prayeth unto it, and saith, Deliver me, for thou art my god. Listen carefully. They have not known nor understand, for he hath shut their eyes, that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. Did you catch that? They have not known nor understand, for he, God, for he hath shut their eyes, that they cannot see, and their hearts that they cannot understand. All right, go to Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. 
Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered its face, and with twain he covered its feet. With twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled of his glory. Why would the angels say, Holy, holy, holy? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. Mankind has a body, a soul, and a spirit. We are three parts. God made us in his image, body, soul, and spirit. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. I guess you could say holy smoke, right? Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. You see, people, faith, faith saved people in the Old Testament, just like it did in the New Testament. It wasn't law-keeping. The Lord loves us when we acknowledge that we are a man of unclean lips, that we are sinners, and he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here I am, here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. That is some heavy duty stuff. The Lord will blind who he wants to blind and he will open the eyes for those that he wants to open the eyes for. Uh, a note from the person that sent me this study. God will no longer allow them to believe the word of truth, only the lie. Therefore, they'll never ask for forgiveness because they'll never again believe what the Bible says. Isn't that interesting? Go to Acts chapter 2. After the day of Pentecost, well, on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, in verse 21, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Okay. Whosoever, whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But you know what? Those that love their wickedness and their sin more than the Lord, they won't call on the Lord because they'll only believe the lie. Go to Romans chapter 1. Oh boy, I'll tell you what. I, I, this is... Uh, this is uh, the, uh, well, this is a, something that the Sodomites will just, this explains why the Sodomites are why they are. All right, let's go to verse, let's see. Uh, 
All right, Romans 1, let's start in chapter, I mean, uh, yeah, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. They hold the truth, but they do it in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. People, every time you see these so-called atheists fighting against, you know, the creation science and, and like Kent Hovind and what have you, and, and mocking them and making uh, fun and sport of it, talking about our invisible friend. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. The creation of the world is clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, oh, they think they're so smart. Oh, creation, we got proof of evolution. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie. Who changed the the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up. The alternate reading of this could be, for this cause, God gave up on them. It means To me, it means the same thing. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was meet. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge... God gave them over to a reprobate mind. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit. Debate? Oh yeah. They love to debate you on... Uh, when you talk about God's creation, right? Oh no, evolution. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God. I'm telling you people, sodomites are haters of God. Despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, these people know they're, what they're doing is wrong, 
who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Another note here. If a passage repeats a warning, meaning, or command three times, it's of the uttermost importance to the Lord. Hebrews 6, 4 through 6. The idea of having known the word is repeated four times. Once enlightened, have tasted, partakers of, and tasted, you cannot fall away, exchange, or depart from something you never had. How can you depart from something you never had? How can you fall away if you never had something? I mean, you can't say, oh, pff, I lost my wallet. You know, you had to have had your wallet to have lost it. Otherwise, it's like, oh, I never had my wallet. Well, I mean, does that make sense? You know, it makes you wonder I mean, it says they were once enlightened, they've tasted, they were partakers of. And then it talks about falling away, exchanging the truth of God for a lie, from departing. That's scary, people. All right, let's uh, go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now the Spirit, this is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, latter means towards the end, okay, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Some shall depart from the faith. How can you depart from the faith? Depart means to leave. How can you depart or leave something that you never had? Ah, you know, I, I'm just throwing this out here. I'm not saying I have a perfect understanding of this, because I don't. That in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. You know how you take a steak and you get the skillet or, or the barbecue real hot and you throw it on the grill and you sear it so that it, it sears in all the juices? Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. When people no longer feel, when their conscience no longer feels the tugging of the Holy Spirit, when they're doing something wrong, they're doomed. It's over. They're on their way to hell. God has turned them over to a reprobate mind. There is no more salvation for somebody like that, in my opinion. Verse 3. Forbidding to marry is there groups of people that forbid to marry? Uh, if you're a Buddhist priest... Um, they forbid marriage. What about Catholic priests? Are they allowed to marry? No. They're forbidden to marry. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Um, Friday fish, anyone? Commanding to abstain from meats? Friday fish? Hmm. Just a thought. So, note here. This passage is a prophecy of the apostasy of the end times. An apostasy from the faith. Some, not all. For in the worst of times, God shall have a remnant. One of the great instances of the apostasy is giving heed to false doctrines. All right, forgive me, I'm going to be reading some small print here. 
All right, so God will have a remnant. One of these great instances of the apostasy is giving heed to false doctrines. The instruments of promoting and propagating this apostasy and delusion will be done by the hypocrisy of those who speak lies. Men must be hardened and their consciences seared before they can depart from the faith and draw away others. Boy, that is some deep, deep, deep stuff. You know, there are TV preachers on the TV that when they first started off, some of their early sermons were actually pretty good. Um, and then they just went off the deep end. I, you know, may the Lord never do that with me. Of course, I don't have a $60 million Learjet. Um, I'd have a, you know, even if somebody gave me a $60 million Learjet, I, I couldn't afford the insurance and the, um, the airport parking fees, and I, 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 I don't know how to fly, so, um, you know, I could drive a truck, but I can't fly a plane, so I couldn't afford a pilot either. What can I tell you? All right. The word seared. Um, means to render unsensitive. If, I don't know how to explain it. I guess you could say they don't have any feelings anymore. Okay? And the lie means you believe a falsehood or false Christ. We're commanded to study the word ourselves. And you better believe that's true. To not be lazy and rely on others to find the truth for us or take someone else's word for it. God warns us. Over and over and over. And these people... Um, one time, I was uh, invited to a Calvary Chapel down here in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. And I sat through the sermon. And, you know, if I was Satan, I wouldn't have had a problem with the sermon at all. I wouldn't have been offended in the least. I mean, it was, I was just like, what is this garbage, you know? Um, I didn't know what I know now about Calvary Chapel. But uh, John Todd, uh, he was a member of the Illuminati. He said that he gave a bunch of money to start some of the music, uh, so-called Christian music labels, and these people were tied in with Calvary Chapel, uh, Chuck Smith and what have you. I don't doubt it. I really don't. Everything that John Todd warned about in the 70s has come true. Everything. Every single thing that he warned about has come true. Jesus said, by their fruits he shall know them. So, all right, let's continue with the study. I mean, let's face it. In 2 Timothy 2.15, the Bible says, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that is the name of that tune. All right, go to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse uh, 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables. What's a fable? A fable is a, a false story. You know, you've heard of Aesop's fables. Uh, fairy tales, that's basically what a fairy tale is. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ, 
but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Remember the, the cloud opened up and, and, and the cloud said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Well, and this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. Yeah, Peter was there. For, I'm sorry, we all have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All right, let's go to the book of Galatians. I love the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead. And all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil word, world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And people will tell you that Paul is a false apostle. Does this sound like a false apostle to you? Verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. The grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Do you know the Mormons teach that an angel called Moron I, M-O-R, M-O-R-O-N I, Moron I, how about I, Moron, gave Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, Moronism, the Book of Mormon, another gospel. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And there are millions of Mormons. Decent people. I mean, I've met a bunch of Mormons. They were... They... They... You know, they live more righteous than a lot of people do. But they don't have the gospel of Jesus Christ. They're cursed, and they don't even know it. And they'll tell you, oh, well, the Bible's wrong, it's mistranslated, and it's got errors. Oh. Turn to Matthew 24. You know, any... Any Christian that's never bothered to read Matthew 24 is, I don't know, it's sort of like riding around in a car without a spare tire. Actually, worse. Matthew 24, verse 1, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be 
left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And that was fulfilled in 70 AD with all the gold in the temple when the Roman soldiers were putting down a revolt by the Jews, the unbelieving Jews that didn't believe Jesus. They burned the temple down. The gold melted in between on all the rocks. And the Roman soldiers took every stinking stone and cast them down and they scraped the gold off every single piece of gold that they could. There was not one stone left upon another. When the Jews tell you that the Wailing Wall is part of the temple, they're liars. Or Jesus is a liar. Take your pick. There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he, Jesus, and as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Take heed that no man deceive you. Verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Verse 12. And because iniquity or sin, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. What, we can't quit in the middle of a race? Why does it say, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved? Why does it say that? Why is Je this is Jesus speaking, not me. And I and I love the King James. That's the one I trust. All right, Second Peter chapter two. <laughs> oh boy, I'm beginning to see why the uh, Hebrew roots people hate Second Peter. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets among... I'm sorry. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. Like Hebrew roots, right? Even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily, privately, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction and many shall follow their pernicious ways pernicious means hidden and many shall follow their follow their pernicious ways by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of and through covetous covetousness shall they with feigned words when faint when you uh, like in the army when you do do a feigning track tactic, like uh, what you're doing is you're trying to trick your enemy into thinking you're doing something you're not. You, you sort of like fake left, but then you go right. They do that in football too. And through covetousness shall they with feigned words make merchandise of you. Oh yeah. They're going to with their mouth, they're going to sell you. They're going to sell you all their merchandise, their prayer cloths from Israel, and their their anointed oil from Jerusalem, and whatever. And through covetousness shall they, with feigned words, make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. Ooh. You know, I found uh, a really great thing. It's called the King James Bible Online. And uh, it's really wonderful. It's a really wonderful search tool. I find it very, very useful. Very useful. And, uh, you know, it's amazing. When I was uh, in Bible college, uh, it used to take me... Oh, a couple months to do a, a Bible class uh, with the information. 
And I, I did a lot of stuff like online or, or um, a lot of stuff online, right? Uh, one time I was actually able to do a class in basically, I think it was four or five days because I was, the internet was starting to come into being and I was able to use the internet and copy and paste stuff. Whereas back in the old days, I actually had to type. I had to type. I had a typewriter and I had to type all the all these Bible verses. Instead of just reading them and copying and pasting them, I actually, I actually had to type them. And it took me, you know, I was able to do in days what it took used to take me months because I had to type everything. So I'm telling you, the internet, um, I've had preachers tell me the internet is of the devil, you know, but you got to realize something. Uh, the two largest things on the internet is gambling and porn. Not necessarily in that order. I'm not sure if it's porn and gambling or gambling and porn. But, you know, you got to understand something. Is paper wicked? I mean, after all, the Bible's printed on paper, right? But then again, so is Playboy and Hustler. Um, I think everybody knows what Playboy is, even the girls. Guys definitely know what Playboy is. Um, let's see. All right, we're going to go to Matthew chapter 7. Um, let's see. Let's go to verse 13. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly, they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Oh, no. Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth forth bringeth not forth good fruit, is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name, have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works, and then will I profess unto them the scariest words you could ever hear in your entire life. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Wow. That's scary, people. All right, numerous times Jesus warned his end-time followers not to be deceived. Uh, Matthew 24, 4 through 6, 11 and 24, okay? 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, 1 and 3, Luke 21, 8 and 9, Mark 13, verses 5, 21 through 23. If we're those end-time believers, those who see... Um, the signs of Matthew 24, we have great reason to be to be aware and to beware and not believe the lies were, that we're already beginning to hear, renouncing the Word of God, which is the, you know, the Bible, including worshiping the beast and receiving his mark. You know, that's the thing. If you take the mark of the beast... That's worship, people. And that is unforgivable, even if it's under 
threat of death to you and your family. In fact, we're expected to suffer for Christ's namesake. See suffering. 2 Timothy 3.12, Philippians 1 and tw uh, verse 29, Matthew 5.11, 12, 2 Timothy 2.11 and 12, Acts 14.22, Acts 5.40 and 41, Acts 9 and verse 15, Romans 8.16, 17, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 7, 1 Peter 4 and uh, verse 13, Luke 6 and verse 22, 2 Corinthians 12, verses 9 and 10. Yes, we are commanded to suffer for Christ's sake. In Acts 5 and verse 41, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. Yeah. Um, Romans 8.12 And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so, that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. Hmm. In 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer or allow, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. God's not going to give you more than you can bear. So, uh, let's see. Galatians 5.11 And if I, brethren, if I yet preach circumcision, why do I suffer persecution? Then is the offense of the cross ceased. Galatians 6.12 As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Philippians 1.29 For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. Somebody give Benny Hinn a... a, a he must have missed this memo, huh? Um, health, wealth, and prosperity gospel? Oh, yeah. Um, 1 Thessalonians 3.4 For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer tribulation or trouble that we should suffer tribulation even as, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Oh, yeah. Uh, Second Timothy 2.12 If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Second Timothy 3.12 Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. You know, if we go to the bar and, and we're smoking weed and drinking drinks and cussing up a storm, we're not. And you, and you talk a little bit about Jesus, you're not going to suffer any any persecution. You know, I had lifelong friends. I had a friend that I grew up with. I've known him before. From the beginning, I don't remember a day when I first met him. My mother said when I was like three years old, I used to sneak out of the house and go over to his house, which was like half a block away. And we'd be playing in the backyard together. And I don't remember a day that I ever met him for the first time. It's like I've known the guy my whole life. And when I was telling him about Jesus, he's like, oh, you're one of them now, huh? You're one of them. And that was pretty much the end of it. I mean, it's just, you know, and I love the guy like a like a brother. And there's just some people just, they don't hear it. 
1 Peter 3.14, But, and if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Troubled. 1 Peter 4.16, Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. Uh, Revelation 2.10, Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. All right, well, this is the end of part two of Eternal Security versus the Unpardonable Sin. John, Jesus said in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is Chaplain Bob Walker uh, reading a study that somebody gave me. Um, I've Some of it I'm, I've put in there on my own, but most, uh, I would say probably most, well, most of this is their, their work. It's not mine, but I'm familiar with all these verses, but they did such a good job of putting it together. Um, I thought it would be good to share because they asked me a question. Um, the question is, how does predestination mess mesh with this? Well, we'll get to that. So, all right, this is the end of part two. Um, Chaplain Bob signing off. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor to the Lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world. In Jesus' name. Amen.